This is the second screencast about the 10 things to know. This topic is environmental disasters. What you'll see here is a lot of the other things from your environmental timeline that weren't covered in the last PowerPoint. Okay, so one of the disasters that's definitely something you should know about is the Dust Bowl, 1934 to 1940. And the map in the background shows you the area that was most affected as far as the topsoil loss. Um, so down here in the bottom, you see severe erosion um, and sort of the times where that occurred. But the massive area here was in Oklahoma, Kansas, and definitely up through the Dakotas, Nebraska, and into Texas. Those are the impacted areas. This is, again, our breadbasket. This is the area of America where most of our food is being produced. And so this, plus the Great Depression, led to a lot of problems. But it also led to um, some really significant changes in soil conservation practices, even making laws get passed that required farmers to not leave their soil um, barren during the off season because this is exactly what happens with a drought and then excess wind. Another disaster, Denora, Pennsylvania, 1948. This was our first major air quality disaster in the United States and it happened because of a temperature inversion, something that's discussed later on in another PowerPoint. But the smog got captured. All of the industrial pollutants that were being created by their zinc factory because of the way that the winds were, the temperatures, and because of the fact they sat in a valley, everything sat down and stuck with them instead of rising up into the atmosphere. And so that lasted for a few days and it made the air conditions incredibly toxic. And so you see the picture there which is taken at noon, and it looks like a nighttime photograph, and that's just how thick the skies were with the pollutants. The London smog of 1952 was another massive disaster. Uh, same basic ideas going on as with Denora. You had these in close succession to each other, and these ultimately lead to the passage of the Clean Air Acts. Um, both ours that we call the Clean Air Act here in the U.S. and in London for the United Kingdom, it led to a passage of a similar act a little bit before us, but again, they've dealt with smog since before we did as well. Minamata, you probably do not forget this one, especially after watching The Cove, but Minamata is the site of mercury contamination from the Shisu pharmaceutical plant. It was releasing its runoff right into the little bay and you can see right on the map the location of where that was. And all of this contamination got into the water. The fish were then contaminated and since fish was the primary source of protein for the people on the island, that then led them to become contaminated and develop mercury poisoning as well. Lake Erie. 1965 to 1969, it's quite a, a large span there, but Lake Erie came, became so severely contaminated um, that it really was the subject of a lot of jokes. And if you remember from watching the original Lorax, the Dr. Seuss version, that they talk about, um, I hear conditions are just as bad in Lake Erie. That's what the fish say as they leave the pond. And so again, it, it was quite known nationally as a very contaminated lake. The picture here is circa 1965-ish, and you, what you can see is where all of these manufacturing plants are, you can see the sediment and the contamination right there along it. I also brought out this picture here to show you where essentially this would have been the most problematic. Um, so you've got in the United States portion of Lake Erie, You've got everything from Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, uh, Buffalo. So those are all some major cities. You've got massive production along this area. So again, a lot of contaminants. The other thing to remember is that coming up through here, you also have the Cuyahoga River. So the Cuyahoga River in 1969 was the river that caught on fire. Again, lots of industry along this area, and if you look at just what he's got in the, uh, the background, you see lots of timbers. Wood production is a 
big industry up there. And so you've got lots of chemicals that are used to strip the wood, to bleach the wood. Uh, you've got lots of extra timbers that are sitting there. But again, the interesting thing is that just by dipping your hand in, it would become coated with oil. Those oils sit at the surface, and so one spark is set it ablaze. You've also got the pieces of wood that obviously are going to keep the fire going as they burn as well. The OPEC oil embargo of 1973, this is the first time that we really faced the idea that we may run out of energy. But it was looked at as mostly a trade issue at that point, and it was. Uh, OPEC decided that they were going to not include us, and so we faced a massive shortage of gas imports. Um, now again, we saw similar price increases later on, especially 2005 as a result of Katrina and Dennis taking out some of our rigs and refineries um, during that massive year of, of hurricanes. But we've also learned from 1973 and on that energy independence is a matter of national security. So it's a very important lesson for us to learn as far as sustainability, as far as renewable energy, and as far as national security. The Love Canal happened in 1978. Obviously, they had been um, they had been bearing toxic chemicals there a long, long time before this. But 1978 is when they finally came in, they being the EPA, finally came in and realized what the problem was. So before 1978, again, what had happened, a land developer wanted to dig a canal and make a little community that ran on hydropower from this little canal that, that ran in and out of the, um, the, I am forgetting whether this canal was connected to the Great Lakes or to the ocean, but either way, he wanted hydropower for this cute little community. And so he dug the trench, ran out of money, and abandoned it. A chemical company took that land and filled in the ditch with these toxic barrels of chemicals. What then happened is when they had filled it up, they covered it with soil and sold it to the local school board for a very cheap price. You then had a school and a community go up around and on this land and Again, what happened was you started having uh, carcinogens and radioactive chemicals seeping up through the soil. You got a cancer cluster. There's a lot of similarities between Love Canal and what we watched with the Woburn, Massachusetts, a civil action. But this is our major, major case for Superfund. Um, this is when we learned about needing to take care of our pollution, the whole cradle to the grave law was created in response. Three Mile Island occurred in 1979. Remember that Three Mile Island is a nuclear facility. You can see in this picture why it would be called a Three Mile Island. It is in the middle of a river. And this was, again, the site of our, in the United States, our big nuclear catastrophe. Now, in the end, only trace amounts of radiation were released, but this, coupled with the movie China Syndrome coming out in such close proximity, really scared the American public into thinking that what we had with nuclear power was too risky to chance. And so ever since then, we had a moratorium on building nuclear power plants. Bhopal, India occurred in 1984. This is the worst industrial disaster ever in the world. It was a chemical factory um, that exploded in the middle of the night, releasing toxic gases that killed a lot of people instantly. Um, so people in the town that did awake awoke to many, many thousands and thousands of dead and a lot of problems since then as far as birth defects and um, cancers, things that appear later on and are chronic instead of acute. So we had Three Mile Island and we start to feel a little bit better about nuclear because we don't have any more issues and then Chernobyl. And Chernobyl happens in 1986 and you can see from the picture that the devastation is immense. Whereas Three Mile Island still stands, partial nuclear meltdown capped now, Chernobyl is a complete nuclear meltdown with explosion and we're trying to go back in and recap it 
A lot of countries have partnered with us and with the um, with Chernobyl, which is now in the Ukraine, to try to cover up that source of radiation leakage. You can see on this map, sorry, there, there you go. You can see where the radioactive cloud was uh, the 27th of April, which is just briefly after the explosion. And then by the 6th of May, you can see where they were detecting radioactivity. And so this radioactive cloud really does spread out. And because we think of them as being very far away, but if we look at a northern pole perspective, uh, Russia is just, just on the other side of the pole. The Exxon Valdez in 1989 ran aground. It was the result of a drunken second shipmate. Um, the captain, actually, no, sorry, the captain was drunk and went to sleep it off, and he left somebody in charge of the boat who really should not have been in charge of the boat. And he runs it aground. It is a single hull tanker, which means there is no extra protection for the oil. Once you get a gouge in the, in the main boat from the outside, the oil leaks directly out, which now you're not supposed to have single holes, you're supposed to have double holes, but we still have boats that are not equipped with that. But you can see from the picture some of the things that we've talked about with the BP oil spill. Again, you've got your skimmer boats here trying to capture these trails of oil. You've got the oil washing up on the shore, and you've got thousands of volunteers who are out trying to clean it up, clean up the animals, which lose their buoyancy. They lose their ability to maintain their heat. And so this was, at the time, considered a massive environmental disaster, even though it is not the biggest oil leak that has ever been. Um, definitely have been some bigger ones not related to the United States at all, but we hear about the ones that are related to us. Again, the BP oil spill was bigger than the Exxon, but it's not going to be on the AP exam. It's too early to be on there. But if you did have a question about oil spills, you could write about it on your FRQ. Fukushima, same thing. Big disaster, but too soon to have to know anything about it. If you know your facts about Chernobyl and about Three Mile Island, Fukushima does not have to be part of the equation. Yellowstone Fire, I wish I had a picture here, um, but the Yellowstone Fire was in 1988, and it was a massive destruction of the ecosystem. But what we learned from the Yellowstone Fire is that the pine lands in the United States are adapted to fire. They've got their serotonous cones that open up, and we really saw a rebirth of Yellowstone that was uh, quite amazing. And so it was not a destructive event like we had first imagined it would be. Instead, it taught us a lot about fire management and fire suppression that has led in the following decades to a much better system that supports wildlife diversity and supports the forest health. And that is the end of our disasters portion.